that has made a difference. I still like... <laughs> Hey y'all, Jackie here, and this is Fantastical Follies. If you're new here, welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back to the insanity, my friends. In this video, we're gonna play Pokemon and collect all the basic 17th century garb. First, I'm going to make a basic petticoat, and then a pretty little chemise, and finally start mocking up some mid 17th century stays. This is the true beginning of my foray into the 17th century, which is my passion and the reason I started this channel. It's taken me more than a full year to research in order to get to this point. Y'all, that's huge. While I'll continue to explore other eras, this is going to be, let's say, the synthetic whalebone of my content. Get it? Instead of backbone? Okay, that was terrible. Moving on. <laughs> I'm starting my collection with some basic working class garb. Once I get the techniques down, then I'm going to move my way up the social ladder, so to speak. Then, once I have those techniques down, I'm going to start building a 17th century inspired, gender bending, fantastical wardrobe that may or may not pay homage to the book I just finished. Originally, this video was going to be the making of my mid 17th century stays based on these crimson stays from Patterns of Fashion 5. Yes, I thought that I would mock up and build an entire set of stays in an era with very little available information in three weeks over one of the biggest major tax deadlines of the year. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> this is going to be more of a vlogging video than a straight how-to since I am in the vicious throes of busy season at my day job. And to be honest, this is the first time I've done most of this stuff. Nobody ever gets it right the first time, y'all. And there's very little documentation for clothing from this era because there's barely any extant garments, especially in the later half of the century, which is what I'm particularly interested in. This is me fumbling around and learning as I go and taking y'all along with me for the ride. I'll show you in detail all of the techniques I use here in later videos when I can speak about them with more authority. So don't forget to subscribe if you want to see those videos. And I hope you'll stay tuned with me till the end of the video because I may or may not cosplay as a 17th century Misty during the reveal. And why I decided to make this Pokemon themed is beyond me, but <laughs> let's have fun with it. Let's start this battle. Petticoat, I choose you! <laughs> I found a lot of conflicting information about the construction and look of 17th century petticoats, mostly because there aren't any left for us to study. The most thorough sources I've found, which I've linked to down below, say that in the mid 17th century, the petticoats were pleated using cartridge pleats and worn over a hip pad. The silhouette narrows and elongates around mid century and starts fluffing back out to the sides in the 1670s. The cartridge pleats slowly lose popularity in favor of tiny knife pleats, and the progression of this increases in speed, the higher the class, and also depending on the location. It's at this point during the reign of Louis XIV that we're seeing a shift from Italy being the height of fashion over to France and Versailles, but more on that another time. I'm opting for a mid-century lower class look, so I picked cartridge pleats. Hey y'all, it is August 26th. I just got back from my run, which is why my hair is wet and I'm in gross clothes but I wanted to take a minute before I get started and talk about what I'm starting today. And that is my journey into 17th century clothing. I am so excited. Now you're probably saying, well, Jackie, you've already done the kirtle top. We've seen it already. Yes, but that's more of a history bounding, kind of undergarment type situation and not necessarily historically accurate for the time period that we're going to be looking at. Today, we are going to start the petticoat. Now, for those of you who have been with me for a while, you are going to recognize this process a lot. The construction of a late 17th century petticoat is going to be quite similar to the construction of an 18th century petticoat with a couple of exceptions, which I will show you as I'm making it. However, in case you are new to this channel and are here just for the 17th century goodness, I'm going to take the time this time to show you again exactly how I assemble this. I will be hand stitching the entire petticoat. No, it's not gonna take me that long. I anticipate this 
being a weekend project. It's Thursday, so I suspect by Sunday I will have a completed petticoat, if not sooner, depending on what time I get finished editing this afternoon and how much time I sit in front of the TV this weekend. In any case, let's talk about this petticoat. I have two lengths of linen fabric. I'm using 57 or 58 inch wide linen. Because it's that wide, I cut it across the grain so that here is the selvage. It is, let's say 58 inches wide and it is 38 inches long. That is essentially the length from my waist to uh, slightly above my ankle. Now this is going to be a working class petticoat and actually closer to a lower working class, even venturing on the peasant side of the scale of class of clothing uh, for two very specific reasons. One, I'm working from the bottom up and two, because I'm going to be wearing this for every day and I uh, want something simple that is not super fancy and also something that's not going to interfere with my sneakers, which is what I live in. In any case, so, and to give you an idea of proportion, I am five foot three and uh, I have a very high waist. So that's 38 inches. You will have to adjust that depending on how tall you are and what class of petticoat you're making. Generally, the higher class is going to have a longer petticoat because they can afford it and they're not working in the fields and so it's okay for their fabric to touch because one, they're not going to be doing manual labor and two, they have somebody to clean their stuff for them. Now let's get down to the board and I will show you what I'm gonna do next. Okay kids, so the first portion of this is gonna look real familiar. First I marked about nine inches down on each of the side seams for my pocket slits. Late 17th century pockets are pretty darn similar to 18th century pockets, so for now I plan to use those for all of my 17th century stuff. I pinned the rest of the side seams down, giving a scant quarter inch allowance on one side. These seams will get sewed using a backstitch and the excess used to fell over the edge. I don't technically need to do this here because it's on a selvage, but eh, it's fuzzy and ugly so why not? Then I'm turning under the seam allowance for the pocket slits and turning them under again. I'll sew these using a small hem stitch so it isn't super visible from the outside. All right, so the one thing that is going to distinguish this from 18th century petticoats is that this is actually going to be back closing. There is no documentation, according to my one major source for this, that they did side openings. That doesn't mean that it didn't happen because you know most of these petticoats are underneath bodices or stays, so we don't really see the ties but the ties that are visible, the petticoats are back closing. What I'm going to do is stick with that back closing because I'm going to be wearing this as a normal skirt and I think it'll be a little more aesthetic for me to have one tie in the back and two ties on the side. Um, however, I do wanna use my side pockets, so we're gonna have side slits. So we're venturing a little bit further away from what we're supposed to. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to mark the center back. Now. Logic says I should cut a seam here and then seam it up and fell it like I'm going to do the rest of it. Would they have done that in the time period? Yes, because the fabric widths were about half the width that they are now. So there would naturally be a seam here, but there is not. I don't need to because I'm using 60 inch fabric. What I'm gonna do instead is just cut a slit. Why make all of that extra work for myself when I don't need to? So what I'm gonna do is I am going to pull a thread. There's my thread. Whoop. Okay, and I'm only gonna pull it to about, I'm gonna say seven inches. This is just a guess, but we'll try it and modify in the future if I need to. I don't want it to gape. Pull a little bit. And then just gently pull this thread. Ta-da, okay. So what I'm gonna do now is just do another rolled hem like I'm going to do with the sides, the pockets, but I'm going to reinforce this right here. And I'm gonna snip in just a tiny bit. Okay, so I can get my roll on. And if we don't get no toes, then we don't eat no rolls. Okay, and you will have to finish this. Okay, you can't leave that like that. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna kinda. Of... 
That was potentially a mistake, but that's okay, we can fix it. I'll check back with you after I stitch this and let you know what I decided to do. Here's the finished back slit. I definitely think it was a bad call to do the side snips. While I finished the raw edge fine and I don't think it looks bad per se, I think it lends itself to some gaping issues you'll see in a little bit. Bonus, here's the finished pocket slit. I used this black linen thread from Burnley and Trowbridge for the side seams. It's a 53 weight. So it's on the heavier side, but very sturdy. So I'm using it for all of my invisible seams on this petticoat. And I'll switch to the standard navy poly thread for the hemming so it's not so visible. To fell the side seams, first iron the seam flat, then turn under the excess and iron again. Unlike my 18th century petticoats, this is going to have a waistband and the edges will have to be finished before I move forward because we're going to cartridge pleat this sucker. First, turn under the edges on both sides, then flip the sides upward, wrong sides together and press. Turn under the raw edge and then place your tie at the top. I'm using some standard double-faced satin poly ribbon I found in my stash. We're also going to finish the top edge. I'm marking an inch here and then it's a matter of turning it under by half an inch and ironing. Here's the finished waistband, okay? I whip stitched the edges closed. You're not gonna see this. Here is the finished top edge of the petticoat. The edges have to be finished to do the cartridge pleating. Last night I did one of the side back cartridge pleating and you can see it's not like fully cartridge pleated. It's just enough to fit the waistband. If I were to gather this down to be true cartridge pleating, I would need much more fabric, okay? That's more what you're looking for in a cartridge pleat, but I don't have enough fabric to do that. I would need probably twice that. Um, I used about 115 inches, so two widths of my fabric. It's like 57, 58 inches. I can't remember off the top of my head. So I would have needed to cut much more to fully cartridge pleat this, but that's okay. I'm not gonna be we wearing this with any kind of hip support. I'm going to be wearing this mostly without it and in an everyday thing. So I think it'll actually look better without it being super cartridgey. So I'm not gonna show you how to cartridge pleat in this video. I will show you how to do that in a different video when I do it properly, but since this is only kind of, then I'm not gonna do it. So what I'm gonna do now is whip stitch this down to the waistband so that when it flips up like this, it gathers nice and neat. See that? I am going to leave part of the front flat. I think it'll look nicer on me since I'm not using a hip roll to kind of fluff the petticoat out. I am going to leave just kind of, I don't know, center width, maybe 12 inches free in the center and then pleat the sides to the rest of the waistband. Here is the completed waistband, the flat front of it, see? You know, my stitching's not great. This was definitely a lesson. I turned up the waistband here and ironed it. One ribbon was not enough. I was getting gaping at the waistband, so I quick sewed another one in last night. And I also sewed just a basic skirt hook and eye on the gap because it was definitely gaping open, which wouldn't be a problem if I was wearing a shift under this, but I won't always be wearing a shift under this, so I decided to do that even if it's not historically accurate. So all I have left to do, I've turned up the hem by an inch and I'm gonna hand stitch this down and we will be finished. All right, here is the final update on the petticoat. The ribbons weren't working, um, partially because the waistband, I cut the waistband too large. I was following instructions that told me to make the waistband like three inches larger than my waist and it wasn't staying up. So I didn't want to take off all of my hand stitching and redo all of my cartridge pleating. Um, because that's what I would have had to do to get the waistband to fit me properly. And I didn't like the idea of then having to do that every time I needed to alter this petticoat. So I just decided to bite the bullet and go with some modern day skirt hooks. Um, this way I can adjust it pretty quickly if I need to take it in or let it out. It also helps with the gaping in the back because this is a problem, y'all. I will have to wear a petticoat with this, whether I'm doing modern clothing or historical clothing, because it just gapes in the back, partially 
you know, because I did, I made this decision to do this extra cut and then just, it's a slit in the back. In the future, I think I'm going to resort to opening it only on the sides, uh, like 18th century petticoats do, just to avoid that because the slits will be there in the pockets and then I can wear them like normal clothes if I want. With the caveat of if I need to have the closure in the back to get the correct look, then I'll do that. So that's that and let's move on. Jackie calls on chemise. There are no remaining chemises or shifts from this time period for us to study. Most of this is knowledge from other eras and conjectures. I'm basing my construction on this smock from the 17th century women's dress patterns book one, which is from slightly earlier in the century, as well as this very fun and slightly racy fashion plate from the Recoil de Mode de la Cour de France, dated somewhere between 1670 and 1693. Ooh la la! Distinguishing features are lots of lace and frills at the neckline and sleeves, which are very full and very short. Since this impression is lower class, we'll skip the lace for a simpler design. Also, these fashion plates have very witty little poems at the bottom. If you'd like to see me do shorts of me reading and translating those, let me know in the comments below because I think it might be kind of fun. Okay, so this is the 17th century shift. I assembled this months and months ago up to cutting the neckline. Oh, I did not film this because it is constructed almost entirely like my 18th century chemise. And I will link to that in the card at the top corner of the screen. Was this exactly how shifts were constructed in the 17th century? I don't know. Because of course I went for the reconstructing history pattern because they're the only ones that had anything and I bought it last year before I knew better. Literally, their instructions are, if embroidering your shift, cut the pieces as directed, embroider them in the flat, then assemble the shift as directed below. Here's the assembly for the neckline, and that's it. That's their only instructions. There are no instructions for assembling the shift in this. So I went with what I already knew. I am going to use that as a vague guideline to do the neckline. Here are the differences between the 17th century and the 18th century shifts. Mostly that I made it wider than I needed. I am going to gather this up in the front. I also made the sleeves a little bit wider and longer. The sleeve is seven and a half inches wider than my largest bicep. It's two inches longer than the length from my shoulder point to my elbow, plus three inches for a self ruffle and for seam allowance. I could have made the sleeve wider, I think. Then I gathered all of the excess in the top and um, we are going to make a ruffle because this is a lower class shift, so they wouldn't have been able to afford a lot of lace. And then this will sit kind of around my elbow and you'll get a nice little puff of fabric that is indicative of the mid 17th century. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is cut a little slit in the center to get my head in, and then I'm gonna put my stays mock-up on. And the reason I didn't finish this shift is because I wanted to make sure that I did it on the actual stays that I was going to be wearing for this. I'm gonna put that on and we're going to test the stays mock-up and figure out where we wanna cut this at the same time. Once I had the approximate spots on my chemise marked where I wanted to cut, I used a ruler to even out the two sides. We're aiming for a very low square neckline. While the 1640s and 50s don't have quite as much revealed up top as the later half of the century, we're still seeing some uh, lifting, shall we say? Since reconstructing history's only instructions are on the neckline, I used them. They say not to cut the back, but once the front is cut to fold it in half in the center and then cut a 10 inch slit down the back. Not sure why, because it doesn't give any instructions for adding ties or anything, but since the two main sources I have for doing my chemise both have slits down the center front instead, I'm going that route and still marking the back for cutting. Later, I cut out my neckline with a 7 8 inch seam allowance. This will give me enough fabric to make a channel for my ribbon. I had second thoughts about cutting the back, so I tried it on first without cutting it, and boy was I glad I did, because you don't need to cut the back. I guess I did get some good advice from reconstructing history after all. Then I turned under a scant quarter inch and folded this over to meet my actual neckline. This will leave a channel that I can then lace my drawstring through. Whoops, almost forgot to cut my center slit. Gotta have a spot for the drawstring to come out. I 
I decided to turn under and hem the edges of the slit first before closing my channel. I'll sew that bit first. On my body, I marked the spot where I wanted the bow of the ribbon to be tied. I'm opting to do eyelets to gather the sleeves. The one blog I found with any kind of chemise detail tried both gathering the sleeve to a cuff and just tying it with a ribbon, both techniques which are documented. She liked the ribbon better and I agree. I think it looks prettier and there is also the ease of adjusting to fit arm size as well as being able to change out the ribbon to match your outfit. However, I thought that just tying the ribbon would end in losing the ribbon eventually, so I came up with the eyelet idea. Not documented, but they obviously had eyelets, and it makes as much sense to me as sewing on a strip to make a channel. I did some math and decided to do an uneven amount of eyelets. That's right, folks, I'm knocking this bitch up to 11. I divided my sleeve width by 11, which didn't come out quite evenly, but I'm making eyelets spaced one and seven eighths inch apart, starting from the center. Then the one distance that ends up being uneven will be hidden in the back where nobody will notice. Here is the finished channel. Here's the inside. I just did a basic running stitch because it's not really bearing any weight. It's just gonna have a little ribbon in it. I will say that it was kind of difficult to get it sewn around this corner here. I cut it very like right angle um, because I was expecting to cut the back and then I saw sense and did not. This was a little hard. Next time I would round off that edge just a little bit to get this channel nicer and neater. It really doesn't matter in the long run that there's these little gathers. It's going to be gathered anyway, so you won't be able to tell. Here are the finished eyelets on the sleeves. It's definitely not the finest and most delicate of a look, but since I'm going for more of a like lower working class, almost peasant level of dress, it, I think it's fine. It didn't take me long to do. They're <laughs> definitely not even, but who cares, right? Nobody's perfect. I do have the center marked with a pin. So now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and lace these up. I really like the idea of being able to change the ribbon out to match my outfits. I think that's kind of a cool concept and seems like a logical thing that someone would do who doesn't have a lot of money. They could, you know, spend their money on a nice little ribbon and change it out to vary the look of their clothing without too much cost. Okay, so I made a mistake here. Um, I thought I needed an uneven amount of holes, but I needed an even amount of holes because the idea was that each of these would alternate and then both of them would come out in the center, but this one is going down. Um, so I actually needed an even amount, but that's okay. You know what? It'll, it'll pull from here instead and it'll be fine. Stays, I choose you. Stays, which are the not-so-ugly middle child between Elizabethan bodies and 19th century corsets, really came into their own during this century. It isn't until the 1670s, when the robe de chambre, or mantua as we know it today, gains popularity, that stays finally start hiding underneath the gowns. During the earlier parts of the century, they're worn front and center and on display. Distinguishing features include off-the-shoulder straps, tabs that get tucked under your petticoat, and a... Stomacher. Okay, so weirdly, I did my cardboard mock up. Here it is. Here's the stomacher. I definitely had to piece it together. I kind of ripped it, but um, when I put this on, I didn't even like lace it together. It was very clear to me that 
this was gonna fit all right. In fact, it might be slightly big. We're going to figure that out in the fabric on the body because I was really just checking for waist length, which is good. I did kind of shorten the tabs just a little bit because I actually think it's a little too short waisted for me somehow, but not by much, only by about a half an inch. So I'm excited that I don't have to make a lot of crazy modifications to the pattern. We'll see how it does in fabric with boning, but I think that I am just ready to cut it out. So yes, you recognize this fabric. This is what I bought this fabric for, not the other project. So one thing, there is no grain direction indicated on these. So I am just making the educated assumption that this wants to be on the straight grain and this wants to be on the straight grain. Now this isn't completely straight. It kind of goes in and out a little bit. I'm gonna leave that because I noticed on my 18th century stays that my body does that too. I'm definitely gonna give myself a little bit extra seam allowance on all pieces and that'll give me a little bit of things to play with. Also, I just need to point out that these look very much like pizzas, tiny, tiny little pizzas. And I really wanna make a pair of stays like this, but with them be actual pizza. Please do not encourage me. Okay, I'll keep going. Well friends, I basted all of this together, tried on to get an idea of what I was dealing with and when I put it on, it before I even got it, it just got stuck and it ripped zoop, all the way up right here. That, my friends, is why there are gussets here because this just, whoosh, and it wasn't even, it wasn't even wrapped around me tight. I was literally just putting it on and this got caught somewhere and it just ripped. So I took it off and I surged it. That's going to affect my mock-up a little bit. I haven't 100% decided yet, but I might recut this piece. In any case, I did decide that there was no way I was gonna figure out how this was gonna fit me unless I get it all together. So I am going to flatline all of my pieces and I'm also going to take my pattern and redraw the boning channels because these, this boning is meant for very small boning, like eighth inch and I've got quarter inch. So what I'm gonna do is use this as my guide and I'll probably do three eighths inch channels and just go all the way out on all of these pieces and then transfer that onto the canvas and start drawing the channels in. This minute old when I realize exactly how much work this is going to take. Doing all of these boning channels is gonna take so freaking long, y'all. Oh man, hopefully the result will be worth it. So I'm gonna get started. I'll catch back with you in a little bit. All right, friends, I have run into a slight issue. I spent a good half an hour tracing three eighths inch lines all across the front. And then because I'm extra, I flipped it over and retraced it onto the back so I could see it better when I hung it up on my window. However, because I used Sharpie, I have run into an issue. Can you guess what it is? These are supposed to be 3 8 inch channels. And if you look, they are, but it doesn't account for the fact that these lines are super thick because I used Sharpie. And if you take my boning and put it in between this channel, it is very clearly half an inch. I'm really annoyed at this and should have anticipated this being a problem, but I didn't because sometimes I'm an idiot. So what I'm gonna do instead is manually draw on all of the boning channels on my lining pieces and use that as a guide to sew the boning channels. This is gonna sound crazy, but before I actually put the boning in and mess it up, I'm going to photocopy the fabric and print it out so that I have an exact pattern that I can then use on my actual fabric. That way I don't have to completely redraw everything again. Now, if I have to modify the pattern, then I may have to modify the boning channels, in which case I'll have to do it again. But fingers crossed, um, if I have to make any modifications, it'll be slight enough that I don't have to change the entire pattern. Once that nonsense was finished, I went ahead and sewed up my boning channels. The center of the stomacher on the extant stays has two thicker, firmer pieces of boning on either side of the busk. So I'm testing it with my thicker half inch zip ties that I used for my mullet stays. 
That didn't quite work, so I opted for these four pieces of steel bones that I bought for my Regency stays, but couldn't use because I had to shorten that pattern so much. Commence, Grumpy Jackie. Okay, trying to get myself in full frame and lit at the same time in this freaking apartment is almost impossible. This is the best I can do, okay? Um, it's not fully boned. I did about a third of them. I can already tell it's too big. This is almost completely closed. I can't. Um, this is almost completely closed in the bottom, so I only have about an inch opening and I think it wants a little bit more than that. I think I'm gonna take it in just a little bit in the back, maybe a half an inch. I don't wanna do too much. So I definitely think I'm going to have to snip it up to my waist. I intentionally left it a little long waisted. Um, I keep going like this because the straps just don't, uh, the straps are too long. So I'm gonna have to pick up the straps just a little bit. I'm getting like Regency bust and not 17th century bust, but we can go ahead and get started on the neckline of this. I think a few days later, I finally started fixing my issues at least my issues with the mock-up. First order of business, removing the boning from either side of the center back seam. I'm then going to sew that up using the channels as a guide. So I've taken this in three quarters of an inch or three eighths of an inch from each side. If you can see here from my markings, I went ahead and marked the original tab cut spot before I cut or boned anything. I'm going to trust that that's the right spot to cut and go ahead and make those snips. Then I'll need to remove the gussets and place them higher up. Hopefully that works, fingers crossed. Like I said before, there's not really a good place in my apartment to get a nice full body shot of me. Um, so I'm sorry y'all are gonna have to deal with portrait mode here for a little bit because it is literally the only way that I can get myself in frame in a place that is relatively well lit and uh, not a complete disaster behind me because it's busy season and let's just not talk about the state of my apartment right now. In any case, after I made those changes yesterday, I tried this on and it was late so I didn't film it. I mean, it was very late, uh, probably like 10 o'clock by the time I got all that stuff done and um, tried it on and it is amazing how much of a difference it makes when you have the tabs cut at the right spot. I'm gonna do a little spin and just take a look at how well this is fitting me now. Do you see how the tabs are breaking right at the smallest part of my waist? And there's no wrinkling happening at all. It's good. However, I don't feel like I'm as supported as I should be. I'm not quite getting the high neckline that I need. Part of that, I think, is because I'm not wearing the right neckline of my shift. Part of that last night was I was still getting crumpling on my stomacher and I hadn't pulled in uh, the shoulders a little bit. So I have done the shoulders. That has made a difference. I still like... <sighs> what is it? Um, I'm definitely going to have to modify this because in theory I want to be able to like sword fight in this and I could do I could do a little bit but um, it's not quite as much mobility as I'd like. I'll show you what I'm gonna do about that later. So this afternoon I literally duct taped three pieces of boning horizontally on the stomacher <laughs> because I was impatient. I didn't have the time to make my little boning channel thing, which I'll show you in the final making of these stays. That made a huge difference on uh, how this neckline is doing. However, I do want to take these straps off just for a second because the real issue is I still think that it's a little bit too big in the front. Ideally, I had wanted these stays to be supportive enough to take off the straps completely. There's some gaping still up here. Like, I feel like if I didn't have the shift on, this would be indecent. I think I might take it in a little bit in the center. It's so hard to do because of the way this is shaped. I think I'm gonna just take it in a little bit, maybe just one boning channel's width on each side, just to tighten it up a little bit. I could tighten this too, but we really want to have this nice, triangular shape here. Like this is important. Also, for some reason, I cut this two different sizes. I don't know how that happened. 
this is the right size. Like this should be here. It should be making a line, right? This one is, uh, I don't know what's happening. I am going to go ahead and mark my one inch around the base of my chemise. So we want it to be one inch higher than the neckline of the stays. And then I'm going to give myself a seven eighth inch seam allowance above that. And so what I'm gonna end up doing is making a channel for a drawstring, or in, in my particular case, it's gonna be a quarter inch ribbon. That's the gold poly ribbon that you see me use for like the last three projects because I've got a shit ton of it left over from Taco Bell. So I'm gonna use that as a drawstring here on the neckline. I'm also gonna be using that as a drawstring on my sleeves. We're also gonna cut a small slit down the center of the chemise once the neckline is set. All right, back to horizontal Jackie. Since I knew that the stays were too big and not too small, I went ahead and cut off my extra seam allowance in the center front so I can get a better idea of the final line of the stays. Then I picked a boning channel a few away from the main structure of the front. This is where I'm going to take it in. Then I folded it and matched my stitch lines, then went ahead and pinned it down. Next was a baste on the machine. Okay, I'm gonna do that to the other side and try it on. I'm thinking I may have to take in another channel, but I want to test this first because with stays and other corsetry, a little can go a long way. I'll double check this and see how it looks. If it's still a little big, I'll probably take it in in this section here because I don't wanna mess up this line. I had noticed that the armhole was a little big too, so I will do that. But I think I'm gonna stop here for this video. This has got me to a point where I can at least get my wool cut out for the real one because I have to dye it before I even start and I would like to do some embroidery on it. That's gonna take me a little bit. Um, I am going to want to wear this around the house for a while wear it in and make sure that it feels comfortable before I make any final decisions. But we will see that in another video. And now, time for the reveal. There you have it. Despite its obvious flaws, I am in love with this petticoat. I have already worn it in public and it's super comfy. I think that the decision to make it flat in the center and then pleat it on the sides makes it ooze 17th century. I can't wait to see what it looks like over hip wool. The ribbon ties on the sleeves of the chemise are really hard to tie on my own. I tied them before I put on the chemise and wiggled into them with only mild success. I haven't worn this with the finished stays yet since the stays are still in bra mock-up form, so I'll let you know in a further video how the neckline and sleeves fare with something other than a kirtle. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see the results of that. It'll be a little bit before we see the final reveal of my stays for one fun and important reason. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> we are about to do a huge nosedive into spooky season, y'all. In two weeks' time, you'll finally see the culmination of my Regency zombie project when I show you how I made both the bloody overdress and the brain reticule. And then it's full stop into the 1830s with my Halloween project, which is going to be a bat dress. 
Woohoo! Can somebody say power sleeves? I'm participating in Cape Timber this year, hosted by Shannon Makes and Jillian Eve. So next Thursday, there's going to be a surprise, short and slightly chaotic video of me making my cape for September. So stay tuned for some serious twirling. That's about it for me today. Thank you all so much for making it this far. I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to hang out with me today. I am so excited to be starting this venture, finally. I love of the 17th century so much. The feminine wear is gorgeous and the masculine wear, well, it's almost as frilly and silly as Regency court gowns. So of course I love it, right? What are everyone else's favorite eras? Leave me a comment down below and let me know. Who knows you may inspire another silly video like this. Thank you all so much and I'll see you next time. Like I said before, there's, oh, wait. Did you feel like you were in a wind tunnel? <laughs>